This week's topic is coastal hazards, tsunamis, and hurricanes. The questions are, would you live near a coast, and if so, where? Uh, what level of risk from tsunamis and hurricanes is acceptable to you? Now, these two hazards are very different, so you're going to have to keep that in mind this week as you do this. Um, and different coastlines are susceptible um, to tsunamis or hurricanes, and some are susceptible to both. Um, in the United States, you'll find out that they're pretty much um, separate hazards on different coasts. But elsewhere in the world, there are coastlines that are susceptible to, uh, to both. How would you know if the risk was assessed accurately? How do we figure out the risk for tsunamis and the risk for hurricanes? And how do we assess that? And these are both the short-term risk, like is it about to happen? What are the warning signs? But also the long-term risk. How do you know which coastal areas are susceptible to these risks? And then what should be done by people and communities in coastal areas to prepare for the hazard and prevent catastrophe? And you'll discover that the big hazard in both of these is going to be coastal flooding. Uh, wind's a big deal with hurricanes, of course, but coastal flooding is, is what they share in common. And how people address the risk of coastal flooding um, is very often similar uh, for these two uh, different hazards. So some other questions to consider are what factors influence the impact of tsunamis and hurricanes, what coastal hazards and what physical earth hazards, um, and how do these hazards vary from place to place and why. So let's take a look um, at the coast in general first. Over half of the Earth's people live within 50 miles of a coast. So we're talking about a large number of people at risk for these hazards. Um, coastal areas are typically susceptible to flooding, especially if they are low-lying coastal areas. So let's look at tsunamis first. Tsunamis form when you have an offshore earthquake. And it's not the earthquake um, waves that create the tsunami wave. It's actually the movement of the land underneath the, the water surface. So you can see here on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see the fault movement. So if the bottom of the ocean doesn't shift, you don't get a tsunami. Um, there are other things that can cause tsunamis. Um, a large meteor impact, for example, would displace water and create a tsunami. Um, a big landslide underwater can create a tsunami. But most of the tsunamis that we see are caused by underwater faults moving. So typically you feel the earthquake and then the fault shift that created the earthquake also can create a tsunami wave or a seismic sea wave. Um, tsunami actually means harbor wave. And the reason for that <clears throat> is that when the tsunami forms, you'll notice that kind of in the middle of that picture, they show the waves um, on the open ocean, uh, the wave height less than a meter, which is less than three feet. Uh, these waves are moving at 500 kilometers an hour. So they move very fast. They have a wavelength of anywhere um, from 100 to 200 miles. So very long wavelengths, very short. In the open ocean, you would not notice this wave. But because of the way waves work, this particular type of wave moves all the water in the ocean. So all the water, all the way to the very bottom of the sea is moving. A typical wind wave only moves the water in the top 50 or 100 feet of the ocean. So these waves um, move all the water in the ocean. They're very different. They're very fast, very short on the open ocean and moving all the water. So what happens is when they get close to the shore, all that water wants to keep moving. And so the <clears throat> amount of water available is a lot less. The depth is less. 
and the impact on the wave is that it gets taller and the waves get closer together so you'll notice that as it approaches the shore this tsunami has a shorter wavelength and a much higher wave height and their wavelengths um, I'm sorry their wave heights can be as much as 30 or 40 feet and they may slow down to as little as um, 40 or 50 miles an hour so they go slower than they did on the ocean but still a 40 or 50 mile an hour wave is pretty fast and a wave that is um, 30 or 40 feet tall is very high uh, some tsunamis when they get to the shore are only a couple of feet but the really damaging ones can be quite tall so you get this onrush of water and here's what it looks like you can see in the background this is a tsunami that uh, damaged the Indian Ocean uh, communities all around the Indian Ocean back in I think it was 2004 and what happened was there was an earthquake offshore of Indonesia and that wave raced across the Indian Ocean and impacted uh, the coastline of Sri Lanka and India and <clears throat> as well as the coastline of Indonesia and other countries around the Indian Ocean. You can see on the right hand side the impact it had. These waves are so big that they can just wash over coastal islands and wash over low areas. Very often the first sign um, that something is wrong is the trough of the wave arrives and the water moves out very quickly and can expose parts of the ocean bottom that uh, that nobody saw exposed uh, in the past so it kind of surprises people they go wandering out um, but then the crest comes in and it comes in very quickly and there's no time for people to get away the other signal is if you feel the earthquake but if you are across the ocean basin you're not going to feel that earthquake so this hazard can be kind of tricky if you're near where the earthquake occurred the waves will probably reach the shore in 20 or 30 minutes so you get a very small warning you need to evacuate immediately because if you look at this picture um, there's no safe place um, near the shoreline so you gotta move fast if you're across the ocean you don't get that earthquake warning but as we'll see uh, in a few minutes um, there is a way to send a warning ahead of this wave even if it's going 500 kilometers an hour which is several hundred miles an hour it's going to take hours up to a day to cross um, a large ocean basin so there's time to get a warning out ahead of the wave and get people to safety. So the response is to identify areas at risk. Where are there areas of the coastline um, where there is a fault in the ocean basin that can create a tsunami? So that's identifying areas at risk. Um, generally speaking, around the Pacific Ocean is, is considered the highest risk and around the Indian Ocean as we've learned is a is a relatively high risk as well the risk is a little bit lower um, around the Atlantic Ocean and again it has to do with whether or not there are faults underneath the ocean that can generate these kinds of waves uh, the fault that usually generates big tsunamis is at what we call the subduction zone where one plate is kind of diving under another and then there's the warning systems so <clears throat> if we look around the ocean basins I guess I should put this up first you can see the orange and the red are the higher risk and the green is lower you'll notice around the Atlantic it's mostly green around the um, Pacific and Indian Oceans we get the red and the orange um, if you identify an area you can go to the coastline and say where are the low-lying areas and you can map those out and the map the little inset map here is an example of that type of risk map the very low areas are in orange and the areas at risk from a larger tsunami only are in yellow 
So how do we send a warning? Well, the trick is that these waves affect all the water in the ocean, whereas wind waves only affect water in the top uh, 50 or 100 feet. So that means you can put a special type of press pressure sensor at the bottom of the ocean, and the only waves it's going to detect are tsunami waves. It sends a signal to a buoy that's floating above it, which sends a radio signal out to um, coastal areas to say, hey, a tsunami's on the way. So the way the system works um, today is if there is an earthquake, we start looking at these tsunami sensors, these pressure sensors, and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and then if the pressure sensor says, hey, there's a tsunami, we send the warning out and people start to evacuate. Switching over to the hurricane hazard, um, the hurricane hazard, we've learned about storms already. A hurricane is what we call a tropical cyclone. Um, the big threat that we get from hurricanes, and you can see there are these big rotating storms, is we get very high winds, and the storm will tend to push water in front of it, creating what we call a storm surge and there will be large waves on the ocean, wind type waves. So the impact that we see is something like this. We typically get water from the storm surge, which is this big pile of water being pushed in front of the hurricane, can come up over the coast and kind of push inland and damage houses. You can see it can kind of push through islands and cause a lot of erosion problems. On top of that, the high winds create large waves, and those large waves can then do additional damage because now sea level is higher with the storm surge. We also get heavy rain, so we can get a lot of rain. That typically affects people farther inland because the people on the coast are going to be worried about the storm surge and the waves. And we get very high winds, which can cause a lot of damage as well. So where is the hurricane hazard the highest? Um, in the United States, it's highest along the east and gulf coasts. This shows um, the percent chance of occurrence in any given year of a hurricane striking. And this is based on past hurricanes. And the high and lower hazards, the highest high and moderate hazards are shown on this map that's on the right. You'll notice that the hurricane paths are roughly the same um, as they affect the United States. The hurricanes come from the east. They travel west across the Atlantic Ocean in the equatorial area. And when they get into the Caribbean region, they will start to turn north and kind of curve around. So that's the general patterns that they take. Our understanding of past hurricanes allows us to forecast hurricanes. So what the National Hurricane Center does is it keeps an eye on the Atlantic Ocean for these systems as they develop. And then as they develop and move, the National Hurricane Center will generate a forecast that will show the probable track of the earthquake, earthquake going several days out. Um, to prepare for this, what coastal areas do is they also simulate the inundation or the flooding. And that's what this picture in the upper right is. It's not an actual flood. It's a map showing likely flooding um, to a certain level. So, And knowing that, you can develop certain areas along the coast um, with zoning. You can say, look, if, if you're going to live in this area you need to build your house to a certain height so that the water can move underneath it. Um, people also need uh, insurance and they can build some barriers to flooding and so this slide just lists some of the some of the responses. The other thing of course is with the inundation simulation is to plan for um, evacuation and so that's a big deal if you know an area is going to get flooded you have to evacuate